And I've asked Brother Gabriel to preach tonight. I think a lot about this man and his family. Brother Gabriel is a very, very good man. And I appreciate him and his family being a part of this church. When I walk down, I'm going to be tag team teaming with him tonight. And uh, But he's going to take his liberty. Whatever God wants is what I want. I said, Brother Gabriel, you feel like you got the message? He said, yes, sir, I feel like I got the message. Right. Amen. So are you going to open your heart and your yes, mind to what yes, God's going to yes. speak tonight? As he comes to this pulpit, can you lift your hands and pray right now that the word will fall in your heart and that it will be received in Jesus' name. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear the presence of God for us. For then must he often have suffered since the foundations of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. All right. All right, yes. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that took for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, you may be seated. For the past few weeks, there's been a theme that's been weaved throughout this church. I've paid special attention to it. Because this message was given to me weeks ago. And as I've come to church services and I've heard the preachers preach, I've heard the evangelist, I've heard Pastor Rankin, I've heard Bishop Kite, that theme seems to continue. Right. Okay. Now the problem is that I feel so much pressure tonight. Because after what Bishop Kite preached on Thursday. Lord, teach me to number my days. Yes. There's a heavy message about life. About the ends of our life, the beginning. And the reason why it's pressured me so much, especially then, because it was after that message that Pastor Rankin asked me if God had given me a message. He already had three weeks ago. See, this message is not reactive to messages that have been preached. This message was already preempted long ago. And what worries me so much is what the theme of this message is. And if God wasn't through Thursday with what he preached, will it be tonight? Will it be someday in the future? The title of my message is A Matter of Life and Death. In the Bible, I saw that there are three instances of death and life in the Bible. The first group that I see is the carnal death and life. We are born and we die. Our carnal bodies were taken from our mother's womb and one day we'll return to the earth. The second life and death is spiritual. Right, come on. We die to ourselves. To live for God. And the last and third one is eternal. Forever in the presence of God or eternally separated from God. And we look at the carnal, it means something different to everyone in here. When you're young, you think about life, you think about the future. You look to the future. You almost wish your life away. You can't wait to get to the next step, to the next opportunity. 
and that's responsibility. And then as you age and you progress through life, things begin to transpire. Things begin to speed up. Yes, sir. You begin to see things and situations around you. Birth and death. Life and an ending. And you begin to see it transpire. And as you grow older, it becomes more realistic to you that we're all headed towards an end. That's right. Bishop Pike tells this wonderful illustration about the man in the wheelbarrow on the high road. He goes across the ledge of two great cliffs. He says, do you believe I can do it? And Everyone says, yes. He goes across and he comes back. Everybody claps and cheers. He says, do you have faith that I can do it? Do you trust? They say yes. He says, get in the wheelbarrow. Now, when you think about that, how terrified would you be? That wheelbarrow is our destiny. Every single one of us have a ticket to that wheelbarrow. Okay. One day, we're going to have to get on that wheelbarrow and trust that the hands of God Yes. Will get us through to the other side. Yes, now Bishop Pike, he was really on to something. The people that are on the edge, the later ends of the yardstick, they see their frailty. They understand something that so many of us don't. And as Bishop Pike said, that if he could go back, if he knew then what he knows now, he would have made some different decisions. Right. right. Well, tonight, church, it's time to really think about those decisions. All right, brother. And it's so heavy on me because I don't know if it's just for me or if it's someone out here or multiple people. You see, every single one of you in here was given something special from God. He gave you a talent, yes, even yes. from your birth. You may not have known it. Every single one of us have our own story to tell. We've all been through something horrible yes. that we thought would never end, that we thought no good could ever come of it. But here we are today, and some of us don't think that we have any value, that nothing good came out of it. But the thing is, through that situation in your life that you went through, there's things that you can do that I can't. Yes. There's people that you can reach that I can't. And the thing is that God put you here tonight, and it's a hard burden, and I don't want to do it, because serving God is so heavy. He's such a powerful and holy God. Yes. If we get ourselves in the way of it, yes. then we get ran over. God is sovereign. He's no respecter of persons. Oh. So the talent that he's given you, wow. you return it to him for glory. We yes. start making it yes. about yes. yourself. Oh, you start to falter, you start to fail. You yes, gotta yes, submit yes. and let God work through you. And I just pray tonight through yes. this message yes, that Lord. God will yes. have His way. And He'll get the point across that He's trying to get across. Yes. Yes. So it's the carnal. We're born to die. It's a matter of life and death. God brought us from the dust of the earth. He made clay, He made man out of clay. He breathed into our nostrils that logos, that same breath that spoke the world into yes. existence. Yes. Breathed to man's lungs. Yes, that's good. We go throughout life and we live and we go from the beginning to the end. And in the end, we return to that same dust, our bodies, and that logos that God breathed into us goes somewhere. But the carnal goes beneath the earth. Yes. For a final time. Yes. That's good. The spiritual good. life and death. So we were born to live. Now we must choose to die to live. Yeah. What does it mean to die? God, a holy being, creator of heaven and earth, yes. the universe. Yes, he gave it all up to become a man, to come down to earth. He came down from his throne. 
Yes, yes. To dwell among us. He yes. didn't come by as a conquering king. He didn't come by as royalty. He came by as a servant, a carpenter, a man who worked with his hands. The same hands that put together the foundations of the universe. Now, covered in flesh, covered in limitation, tired, weak, hungry. He suffered just like us, to be like us, yes. to know what it was like. Because here's the deal. In the end, he knew what was coming in Gethsemane. He prayed, he said, God, take this cup from me. Yes. He yes. knew the end that we all moved towards. Yeah. He knew the veil that we would all get in to go across the way. Yes, yes. Let me tell you something. In the tabernacle, there was a place, the Holy of Holies, the only the priest, the high priest could go through. Everyone else brought their offerings to the door. And there the priests, they did the sacrifice. Yes. And they took it back. And only one could cross through that veil and go through to the Holy of Holies, to God's most sacred place. Yes, yes. Jesus, upon the earth, Moved towards that throughout his life, throughout his ministry, building a sinless man. And then it came the time when he stood before, when he knelt before God in heaven in the Garden of Gethsemane, crying tears of blood, not wanting to face what he had to face, what we all have to face. Oh, wow, but he accepted it. And remember, just like us, the same emotions, the same fears and worries he had. Yes. But yes. he still said, I will go. Yes, sir. And he went to that cross. Yes, sir. He had to do it. Yes. When he went to that cross and he hung, he hung up there, he took his last breath and he said, it is finished. Yes, amen. You gotta understand there's no spiritual death without Jesus Christ. He had to die. He had to come down from heaven to this earth to be just like us. Because you see, when we live to ourselves, we die to ourselves. And what power do you have to raise yourself from the dead? Not one person in here can do it. So Jesus had to die in order to go to the gates of hell and take. He took back our soul. That damnation was for us. Then he cried on our shield. He said, God, you send me there. Who will praise you for the death of the shield? No man will. But Jesus went there to free us. Yes, Lord. That's why he had to die. And that's why he had to go to the cross. Spiritually, he was born that day. He opened something. He released something. On the day of Pentecost, that promise that he made throughout the Old Testament, throughout the whole earth, about his coming, about a new promise and a new power. Since then, or before that, every man lived by the law. They lived by the law and died by the law. Right. And the thing is, not one single person in here can keep the law. We fell at it daily. Yes, 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 yes. With the Holy Ghost. God gave us that power, that logos that he breathed into us on the day of creation. He filled us with it. He filled our lungs. And when we die to ourselves, when we choose to stop living for ourselves and finally, truly give everything we have to him and submit it and say, God, I don't have much, but this is what I have. Yes. That's when he gives you that logos. The day of Pentecost when he put out his spirit. That's yes. everyone that yes. saved that raised him from the dead when he spent those days in the tomb and that life, that spirit that filled his body and breathed into his nostrils and brought him a resurrected body that same spirit is within us yes. but the thing is we have to die to have that life right. because it's all about life and death right. we were born to die yes. and we die to live yes. Yes. and that's the way it goes so, without all of this, the enemy has tactics 
to stop us from our spiritual walk. Yes, yes, yes. One thing that he implements that Bishop Kite spoke about this morning was fear. Yes. Now, when I was a child, I used to sleepwalk. And at first, it seemed really innocent. I remember waking up in places other than my bed, and it, it kind of weirded me out a little bit. I remember being by the front door one day, and it, it really did disturb me. But as I got older, I remember waking up screaming, and I didn't know why. So the sleepwalk turned into sleep terrors. As an adult, I finally began to see what it was that was scaring me. Because you see, when you sleepwalk, you're halfway in between awake and asleep. In those younger years, I was more on the sleep side, so I couldn't remember anything. I just remember waking up. But in the later years, it was the opposite. I woke up to darkness, and often I would fall asleep in my arms. So I would be halfway awake and asleep, and I would think that I'm alive, but all I am is a conscious thought, surrounded by darkness. I can't move my arms. I can't move my legs. Fear rippled me, and I said, I must be asleep, but I'm awake. I can think right now. It's so transparent. But the thing is, I was still asleep and I couldn't get out. There was so much fear. And then even later on, more recently, maybe 15 years ago, when I was in Midland, I would wake up from my bed and I would go out in the hallway and I would see nothing or no one. And I couldn't speak because I was crippled, asleep. I couldn't speak, but I knew that I was awake, but there was no one around. And I thought about all the people and the things that I love. And I thought, this is forever separated from love, separated from life. This is how I have to spend eternity. This is really it. I'm not asleep. This is my reality now. And that's what it's like to be separated from God. That was just a little sliver that God gave me. What eternity would be like separated. Eternity of thinking about everything you love. God in an instant. It's fear. So now, when I face death, even though I have faith and I know what Jesus did for me, I know what the Holy Ghost has inside my body right now. And what's going to happen when I take my final breath. Remembering that fear and how it felt, it torments me sometimes. Amen, what torments does the enemy place in your life? Yeah. What have you been through that the enemy keeps reminding you of? The things that he cripples you with. It's like being on a big slide and you go up or bungee jumping or something with heights. And you're scared of heights and you go up there and you freeze and you can't move. That's what the devil does sometimes. He uses that tactic to make you begin to doubt and think, is it real? Am I really saved? What's really on the other side? The next thing the thing he does is he weakens us. He mixes lies with truth. Just like in the Garden of Eden, when he came before Eve, he said, did God say that you couldn't eat of the tree? The thing is, the enemy mixes just enough truth with a lie to make you think or maybe start to question. He puts a little chink in the armor. And even though you know the truth, that nagging voice in your mind starts to plant a seed. And that seed grows. And it makes doubt. Begin to bloom in you, and that weakens you. Wow. He reminds you of the things that you've done in the past, things that you're not proud of, guilt and failures that make you feel separated from your family, that make you feel separated from God. How can He ever forgive me? How can I ever forgive myself? How can I ever serve God or bring Him glory because of who I am? He reminds you of that. He weakens you. We hunger and thirst. 
And we do that that weakens our bodies. When you deprive yourself from the word of God, when you deprive yourself from preaching, when you deprive yourself from church, you begin to get a thirst, a drought begins in your body. You don't notice it at first. It's very, very subtle. Because if the enemy just came and he said, here I am, we would all run. But he has to slowly work his way into your mind, into your spiritual life, and weaken you. So when it's time, and then run in, just like this morning we said with Samson, he said, Samson! Yes. He had no more strength. That's right. That's right. Before you know it, God's going to call upon you, and you're not going to have any spiritual strength because you've allowed the enemy to deprive you and starve you and thirst you and pledge you to death. And you didn't even know it. My God. Life and comfort means that we can relax spiritually and we become weak. You see, when we are following the word of God, when we're praying, when we're having fellowship with God, not just in church, but at home, in our workplace, we begin to strengthen ourselves. We begin to strengthen a bond with our Creator. Yes, Lord. We're feeding the spiritual man. We're starving the flesh. When we have lives of comfort, we tend to put those things down. We don't pray as much. We don't read the Bible as much because we don't need them as much. And after a while, our spiritual bodies begin to weaken. We don't have that same poise that we used to have, that same strength, that same fervor, that same intensity. We become weak spiritually. As Pastor Rankin said today, just like he said, we need God the most when we're in our strength. You see, right now, America, even though it doesn't seem like it because it's going down here really fast, we live in a nation of prosperity. Most of us have no want for anything. There's some that do, but that's the exception to the rule. You go to Iraq, go to Iran, you proclaim the name of Jesus to the imams and see what happens to you. See what happens when they put people in cages and set them on fire alive. People that claim the name of Jesus. People that get lined up and get bombs attached to them and blow it up. Claiming the name of Jesus. And what happened to the early church? They're persecuted. They're fed to lions. They're made sport of in the Colosseum. You see, they thrive under persecution. In America, we think whenever we lose our car or house, we're persecuted. Yes, that's horrible. That's hard. That puts a strain on us, on our families, on our relationships. But when it's life and death, that's when you get the true persecution. And maybe that's why America has become so soft. And maybe that's why we struggle so hard. Because we don't have those obstacles to overcome. We don't have to worry about someone kicking our doors and killing our whole families for proclaiming the name of Jesus. We become soft on our nation. That's good, Brother Gabriel. We become weak. Wow. The enemy also wants to separate us. Separation comes in so many forms. But the thing is, within our families, God created a family unit. A wife to nurture and raise and homemade. A husband to provide and protect. And children to obey God, obey their parents. The enemy is constantly at war with your family because if he can divide you and split you up, he can take one portion out of the equation and weaken the whole family unit and weaken the whole household. And then it doesn't just spread to the house, it spreads to the community. And the community spreads to the town and the town to the state, the state to the nation. We become a divided nation. Not just in our homes, but in our churches. The enemy works to divide in churches, taking doctrine and splitting, saying, is it really important that we follow these standards? Is that really what will separate us? But the thing is, that's the enemy. Regardless of whether it's right or wrong, it's the enemy. Putting the words in the church between the past 
Bible and the fellowship and the spirit of the church divided. The church that's divided will fall. We have to be in the same accord, the same mind. We all have to believe the same thing and want the same thing. The thing is revival. What is it? What is it really? Is it just a couple of services? Is it seven services in a row? The way that I see revival, I see people receiving the power of God, seeing operations of God. And it doesn't just stay in the walls of the church. It goes home. It goes throughout the nation. It goes throughout the world. It's not just a refund or a local thing. It's a life-changing thing. New churches, it springs new ministries, it springs something more than what we have and we've ever seen. And I know you can feel it too. I know you can feel it, but there's more. There's more. There's more. Yes. Wow, brother. Wow. Distractions. The enemy uses distractions. Like I said, in America, we live in a prosperous world. We were born into it. Technology is booming. It's making things easier. It's creating more distractions. We become disconnected from each other. Right, right. It creates a love of the world. We take our eyes off of that final end that we're coming to. That carnal death that we are all headed towards. We take our eyes off of it. And we begin to look at all the pretty objects. We begin to look at all the social media. We begin to look at all the things of this world instead of focusing on what our job here is to do, which is to glorify God. It's to reach for the lost and the dying. He said, tell them that there's another way, that there's a better way. Yes. But we get distracted from those things. You see, if the enemy can distract you, then he can move in to your house. He can move in to your thoughts, to your job. He can make his home in there and you don't even know it. Right. You're looking in one direction and he's behind you and he's taking everything you have. Right. And you don't know until you turn around and you get your head out of the clouds and you yeah. see yeah. that it's too far gone. Yeah. The enemy's already made the destruction Wow. So the thing is, he wants to distract us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I had an uncle. His name was Dean. He meant a lot to me. He was a very, very successful person. He was an electrical engineer. He worked for Virginia Power for years. He went down to Belize, and he helped oversee the building of a power plant down there. He retired from a couple of different jobs and he was very well off, him and his wife. But the thing is with Dean, he had cancer. He had beat cancer before, but it came back. Dean liked games. He liked games that would really challenge him in his mind. Strategy games where he had to really think about the way that he would play them, the characters he would he would do, the, the build. He played them all the time. And I remember when I was a kid, in his free time, watching him play. And every time I would come to visit him, he would be playing those games. A few years ago, me and my family went on vacation to Garner State Park. We were heading that way, and I get a text message. That text message said, you need to call Dean. He's not doing so good. He was on his deathbed, and we didn't know how much more time we had. We were literally about to enter the point where I would have no more cell phone signal. We were about to enter the point of the veil where when you pass through, there's no way back. Okay. We stopped that car. I called him up. It was awkward. I didn't know what to say. I said, Dean, how's it going? We had small talk. The only thing I could think of to relate to him was the games I said, Dean, have you been playing any good games lately? What he said it devastated me. It really made me think. I don't remember exactly what it was, but the gist was. Some things in life that aren't that important. 
Chief Dean was at that crossroads. He was in that barrel. He was about to go across. And he realized what was truly important in his life. And it wasn't the games or the distractions. It was where he was right there at that moment. You see, not all of us are going to get an opportunity to see that moment before it happens. It could be an accident or something that takes you out right away. But Dean saw it coming from far off. And he saw it coming right when it was close to him. He saw the end that we're all heading towards. Because it's a matter of life and death. And Dean, more than anybody else at that moment, understood what was important in this life. And what wasn't important anymore. It's the distractions. Yes. Wow. You see, when we play games, it doesn't matter if it's video games, it doesn't matter if it's Yahtzee, it doesn't matter what kind of game it is. You lose, you go on. You live to play another day. You might play two or three times. You see, when you lose, it's not such a big deal. Maybe your pride is hurt. Maybe you feel a little bit bad, maybe you feel a little bit frustrated. But with life, the stakes are so much higher. When you lose to the enemy, that's it. There's no second chances. You're not going to be here again on this earth. This is it. This is it. This is your one chance. No more. But God has made a way. He's prepared. Thank you, Jesus. First, he wants us... To recognize. He wants to recognize that the stakes are high and it's life and death. He wants the realization that we are here for a short time. The enemy wants us dead. He cares. He doesn't care or he cares if we're saved or if we're not saved. But the thing is the enemy, he doesn't really care if you go to church. Anybody can go to church. Anybody can praise and worship in church, but who are you when you go home? Who are you in the quiet hour when there's no one around? And it's just you and your thoughts. That's when you hurt the enemy the most, and that's when he tries the hardest to hit you, to take you out. Because he doesn't care if we go to church, what he cares about is if we have any power. If we're living out. What God put inside of us if we're allowing God's spirit to work within us. Well, that's good, Brother Gabriel. So, are we saved or are we not saved? Okay. God says that he gave us armor to put on. And every day, we should be putting on the armor. The armor of God. Ephesians talks about it. Ephesians says that we have a helmet of salvation. The helmet protects our minds. The salvation, knowing what Jesus did for us. How he died on the cross to forgive our sins. It protects that mind. Because when your mind's protected, your thoughts are protected. And the fear can't come through and begin to mess with your thoughts. It can't begin to wear you or wear you down. The helmet of salvation is the assurance to know that when we reach that end, that's not the end for us. Yes, and that's not eternal separation. That's just the beginning. Right. That's good. You have the blood, breastplate of righteousness, and it's not our righteousness. Right. By God. If anybody thinks that's it, here for a rude awakening, we have no righteousness. Right. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Right. It's only God's righteousness right. that gives you right. to know that you stand for a God of truth, a God of light, a God of mercy. Yes. And that's who we serve. And that's our righteousness. And the world can't take it away. They want to try to tell us how we're supposed to live and who we're supposed to be. But it's not the world that gave it to us. It's God. Yes. That's His righteousness that protects your heart. Yes. You wear it. You wear it. Honor your God. Yes. The belt of truth. The belt that holds it all together. It keeps it all on your armor. It cinches it up tight. It keeps it from falling off. The truth, the anchor of who God is, what He is, every promise that He's made to us. We know it and we see it. And when the world starts falling apart, 
when we're walking through that valley of the shadow of death, we know that we have the truth when all the lies begin to assail us and fears all around. We don't know where to do or where to turn. We have that truth that God is our righteousness, that God has made a way for us already, that it's not darkness at the end of the tunnel. It's his light. It's his love. It's eternal life with him. And we don't have to fear. That's the truth. The shield of faith. What we hold up, it says that it's to, to strike out the fiery arrows of the enemy. Right, right. And that's what we have faith. We live not by sight, not by what we see, not in this physical world, because God is outside of the limits of this world. He's outside of time and space. Yes, yes. yes. He lives and operates in a world that we don't see. But it's there. And it's guiding us and directing us. Yes, Lord. And that's the shield of faith that we hold up. That even though we don't see it. Even though sometimes we just want something to hold on to. Something tangible to grasp. And the enemy's saying that there's no hope for us. That shield of faith reminds us that it's not what we see. It's not what we know. It's about God, about His promises. It's the faith to know that we are saved. That God is there and He will get you out. He will protect you. It might not be a healing in this life, but in the next, when we have a glorified body, we don't always get what we want here. I know it's a hard thing. And sometimes death can be scary. And it'd be so hard to see the people we love deteriorating or see the violence of torn apart bodies. But the thing is, that's not the end. See, we see it here in the carnal world, but we forget that in the next world, it's not like that. Death is not here. The sword. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, it's our weapon. It's what we stand upon. It's what we use. But how can you use that weapon if you never wield it? How can you use the Word of God if you don't ever train in it? God's given you a weapon for the world to know who He is, how He operates. It's to look and to see that this is not the only thing there is out there. That we're heading towards that end. And there's something glorious there. And when you're discouraged. And when you have doubt. And you're doubting yourself. It says to keep running the race. And when you've fallen. And you can't do anything else. And you have no more strength. Just keep going. Keep holding on. And it's just one breath you have left. Breathe it with everything you have. God's grace is sufficient. He'll do the rest. He'll do the rest. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We need realization of all these things we talk about tonight. That we're all heading to that end. Every single one of us. My mom died when she was 30. I'm 39. I outlived my mom. I think, wow, that's so young. I know some of you have lost it. Young people in here, and it's so hard to think about. So when we realize that it's a matter of life and death, we begin to put things in perspective. We begin to evaluate ourselves. Where are we in our walk with God? Not just in church, where are we at home? Where are we in the workplace? Are we reaching for people? Is it just something that we do out of reaction, out of, out of, out of just habit, or is it something that we truly believe and we live? There's got to be a desperation. You see, when you're choking, all you want to do is breathe. It's the most terrifying thing out there. When you're about to fall from a height and there's no safety harness, it's a terrifying thing to know that if you let go, it's over. 
There's a desperation that's within you. There's got to be a desperation. Just like Pastor Reagan had that desperation. He didn't want to die and go to hell. He stopped everything. Because he knew that God would move heaven and earth. And he knew, though, if he didn't get right, if he wasn't living right with God, then he would die. He would fall. He would never breathe again. We got to get desperate, church. We got to know where our help comes from. We got to realize what direction we're moving towards. Are we always moving towards the Savior? None of us are perfect. As long as we walk on this earth, none of us will be perfect. But we're always a work in progress. We have to take our eyes and our thoughts and our attentions off the things of this world and redirect them back to the Savior who we are. God gave every one of us a special talent. I said it at the beginning, and I mean it with all. With all everything I am. Are you using that talent to glorify God? You don't have to be up here preaching to glorify God. You can do it with your work. You can do it the way you raise your family, the way you bring up your kids, the way you teach them. It could be it could be anything. Do you glorify God? Amen. That's good. Church, I don't know what this message is tonight, why we're so intense. But all I know is that we have to redirect and we have to realize that right now everything is a matter of life and death. If you go back and you look at some of the old the old uh, tapes of preaching, you'll see it. You'll see it. It's weaving. Something's going on. God's calling us to keep our eyes to things above. To keep our eyes on Him. Don't forget it. Don't live in fear. Don't live thinking that the next second is your last. Just live knowing. Just knowing that we have a Savior who made a way for us. What is your excuse? Because this is what God asked me several days ago. Moses gave God five excuses. Who am I? What am I going to say to him? I'm slow of speech. Send somebody else. Excuses. Gideon said, I'm too poor. Jeremiah said, I'm a child and I cannot speak. Hear me today. What excuse are you giving God when God is calling you tonight? What's the reason? What's the reason? Because let me tell you something. The road to hell is paved with good excuses. I would God but this. Follow me. Jesus says, follow me. Wait a second. I got to go bury my father. Look at the excuses. They're all justifiable excuses. He paved he, he said, here's a dinner. I'm about to go to. I bought some oxen. I got to go check on them. I bought some land. I, I got married. I got to go marry my wife. I got to go get my wife. Excuses. Amen. Don't go into eternity with God calling you and you just giving God excuse after excuse of why you can't be what he's calling you to be and why you can't do what he's calling you to do. What is your excuse tonight? It's time to face the excuse and say, you know what, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to die out to myself, and I'm going to do what you are calling me to do. Amen. Let's stand all over the house. Sometimes we need to be reminded that eternity is real. I said it's, it's real. And let me tell you something. Very few things in this life are more important than church. Very few things in this life are more important than church. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the presence of God as much as I can. Because when I'm out of the presence of God, you know who starts getting strong? Brandon. And that's not a good sign. 
But every time I come into his presence, I put my flesh on that altar and I said, you're going to serve God today. You may be tired, but you're going to praise God today. You're going to worship God today. Let's lift our hands right now all over the house. Jesus, I thank you for the word that was delivered unto us. I thank you, God, for speaking to us, God. We take it to heart, God. We apply it, God. Let us understand and realize that we need to know, God, that there is a life beyond this life. But we've got to die out to ourselves. Amen. We've got to die out to ourselves, oh God. Thank you for reminding us once again that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Brother Fuller, very good. Thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost. Thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost. I don't know why I haven't been getting you to read my scriptures because I bet you're like the greatest scripture reader that I've ever heard almost. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for coming. I pray that you were blessed tonight. We'll see you back Thursday. Amen. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. You're dismissed in the fear and the love of the Lord. God bless you.